Good afternoon, folks. Welcome back to the last you'll be glad to hear, and the shortest you'll also be glad to hear, in our four uh, Bonding in the Elements series videos. I didn't actually do four videos, sorry, I didn't. I included these in the first video. Um, this was our last video. We're just about to do the, the very last one here, guys, which is, if you remember, I'm going to stick to red, uh, actually. Uh, let me stick to the same colour scheme here. Eh? So, these were metallic. I'm going to leave blank. Monatomic gases were in this diagonal. Um, covalent molecules were in this diagonal. I think we'll stick with um, the last one. It is covalent again, but it's a giant covalent network. Um, and I'm going to point out uh, the ones you need to know about. I'm going to point out a little trick question the SQA likes to throw at you. Uh, and I've got some pretty pictures as well uh, to finish it off. So I think we'll have a go um, in green for giant covalent networks. I'm going to go horizontal lines. There we go. The last of our four types. Now, there are only three elements you'll be glad to know, guys. And they're right next to each other, so you can't really forget them. They are boron, carbon, and silicon. Um, and that means boron, carbon, and silicon. So that's your three elements that form giant covalent networks. Um, here is an image of diamond, giant covalent network. I have a model at work, uh, not at work, so I can't show you. Maybe we'll do that once we get back to the classroom. Um, you've seen this before in National 5. Each black blob, of course, is attached to four other carbon atoms because the valency of carbon is four. That's why you can only get giant covalent networks when you have a really nice big valency numbers. Look, you can't giant covalent, ne covalent network this. It's only got a valency of one. Um, uh, so this is carbon in the form of diamond. Remember I said last time, uh, it's like news to us perhaps, that diamond can have different allotropes. That's different forms. There's actually a load of different allotropes. There's a really cool Wikipedia illustration on all the different allotropes of diamond, some of which I didn't know about either until recently. Um, so this is the giant covalent network version of diamond of carbon, my apologies, in the form of diamond. You know the properties of a diamond, hardest substance in the world in terms of scratchiness. Um, transparent, uh, really re high refractive index, if you know that from physics, um, and doesn't conduct electricity, is actually a superconductor of um, heat though, interestingly. I only found out a couple of years myself. Giant covalent network. Um, these three look very similar. And uh, one of the, oh yeah, the tripwire for the SQA. I remember what the SQA tripwire was. Remember I said that London dispersion forces exist between all atoms and molecules? Well, technically speaking, there are actually London dispersion forces between these atoms here as well. But you know what? They're like 100,000 times weaker than a covalent bond. And that's what you're going to have to break if you want to try and melt diamond. Good luck with that. That explains exactly why diamond is A, such a good scratchy thing for cutting other things. If you're trying to cut into the surface of a diamond, you're trying to cut carbon-carbon covalent bonds. It's not going to happen. Um, it also explains why diamond has a ridiculously high melting point. You can't. I think it burns before it melts. You can't actually burn diamonds. Please don't try that at home. It's a very expensive way of making carbon dioxide. Um, before we... That sounds like I should be finished there, doesn't it? Oh, so, the, ah, so the trick question is, um, there are London dispersion forces and covalent bonds involved in diamond, but the only one that affects their physical properties, melting point and hardness, are the covalent uh, bonds, not these. These are insignificant comparison to them, even though they still exist. Uh, could I show you this? Just before we go, um, uh, you should perhaps have had it mentioned to you at National 5, but if you didn't, that's not a problem. This is yet another allotrope of carbon. Um, if you look at this, we see sheets of hexagons here. So there's a sheet of hexagons. Here's another sheet of hexagons. Uh, fine. Okay. So is this a giant covalent network? Yes, it is. Um, but if you look carefully, you will see, never mind the perimeter ones, look at the carbons in the center. They've only got three bonds to them. That's not right. Carbon's supposed to have four bonds. What's happened to the fourth electron? Well, the fourth electron has actually become delocalized, and that's what these little bonds here are. The delocalized electrons exist in a sort of middle layer between these hexagons. 
and it holds one layer of hexagons to the underlying layer of hexagons, the surprisingly weak forces. In fact, if I can get one just for a second, here is a prop provided by my incredibly patient uh, wife, who puts up with all my nonsense. Uh, this is a graphite, come on focus, this is a graphite pen from the art department. This is pure graphite. Now, where's my camera lens? I don't know if you can, it doesn't really pick it up on camera very well, which is a pity. But it is, oh there we go. It's actually remarkably metallic looking. And if you think about it for a second, this particular allotrope of carbon has got proper covalent bonds in it, and it's also got delocalized electrons. It's a fascinating hybrid of metals and non-metals. What a coincidence! Something that's just on the borderline here has some properties of non-metals, sorry, some properties of non-metals and some properties of metals. Not a coincidence at all. In the very near future. Remember we told you about that zigzag line? Well, that was dumbing down of reality, as we tend to do a lot in chemistry because it's really complex. And it turns out that the difference between metals and non-metals is not a switch. It's much more, if I, can, if I can illustrate this with this pencil, my wife will be most impressed. It's actually much more of a continuum, which means you start at one end and you slowly fade away to the other. So this is very, very metallic. And as you move over here, it gets lighter and lighter to the point where it becomes non-metal. And that's why this graphite has some properties. It conducts electricity. That's because of these. And yet it's also a high melting boiling point. Its last physical usage is actually as what's called a dry lubricant. On your zip, on your jacket, for example, if you find the zip sticks a lot, if you get yourself a pencil and then rub up and down the zip, you find the zip works a lot better. That's because as I write with a line, it's actually knocking sheets like this. Imagine a stacked up sheet of A4 paper. That's each of these sheets is coming off and leaving this black mark. So, that's all I want to say about giant covalent networks. There are only three elements uh, that do it. Um, you need to know both forms uh, of carbon, actually three forms of carbon in total. We have graphite, we have diamond, and if we flip back to individual molecules for a second, we had Buckminster Fullerian from last time. Um, properties of these are exactly what you would expect. Physically, very hard, high melting points, high boiling points, because you're trying to break covalent bonds when you destroy their structure. And that's all. Thanks for listening.